welcome to the Indian Orthodontic Society International Webinar Series, Ortho Illuminati Phase 2. As you all know, that today is a very important uh, lecture. It's on biomechanics, which, you know, uh, is something which is very critical for orthodontics. And we are lucky to have uh, Dr. John Mark Retroway with us. Welcome, sir, to this webinar. I would like to welcome the president of the Indian Orthodontic Society, the ever smiling and the great, uh, you know, coordinator of all such events in this uh, COVID time, uh, Dr. Silju Matthew, sir. Welcome, sir. Uh, for the webinar. Dr. Sri Devi, Madam, the most hardworking and ever smiling and really energetic secretary of the Indian Orthodontic Society. We are lucky to have Dr. Sanjay Lab as the treasurer and one of the principal office bearers and Dr. Surya Kant Das, the vice president and not to miss out Dr. Sri Krishna Chalsani, the, the soul of the Indian mm -hmm. Orthodontic Society. I welcome all of you. I welcome Dr. Kalyani Trivedi and all the seniors, in fact, Dr. VP mm -hmm. Jayde, I just saw him also on board. Welcome, sir. We are really, really, really happy that you are on board today. Well, uh, as we all know that it's a very uh, important day today. It's Ashtami. It's a, a very important day of Navratra festival and a big time for uh, uh, festivity in India. And all of you have taken out time to be here. It's such a, such a, uh, it speaks volumes about the inclination to learn and also the dedication of the Indian Orthodontic Society, where learning never ends. Well, uh, I would like to uh, say that we would like to invoke the blessings of the goddess. And today we have Dr. Kalyani with us, who's going to actually invoke the blessings. Can I request Dr. Kalyani to take over, ma'am? Thank you, Puneet. And good evening, everybody. I will start with a small Devi Stotra. Shuklaam Devam Shashivadanam Chaturbhujam Prasannavadanam Dhyayeta Sarva Vignu Pashantaye Ya kundi indu tushara hara dhavala Ya shuprava sravruta Ya veenam vardanda mandita kara Ya shweta padmasana Ya Brahmam Chuta Shankara Prabhuti Devai Sada Vandita Samam Patu Saraswati Bhagavati Nishesh Jadhyapaha Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was really, and in, your voice is really, really good. Uh, well, now I would like the president of the Indian Orthodontic Society to give his welcome address, please. Dr. Silju, sir, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Puneet. Uh, greetings and, uh, and happy Navratri and Dasara to one and all. Madam Secretary, the Vice President, President-elect, Principal Office Bearers, the EC members, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Jayde sir, uh, Dr. Opike Krapanda sir, Dr. Sadashiv Shetty sir, and Dr. Jyotindr Kumar sir will be joining us shortly. All the senior members present and dear friends. A warm welcome to the third lecture of the Ortho Illuminati series. This is a festival time. Everybody is celebrating Navratri and the Sarah to follow across the country. And I really appreciate uh, all those who have joined here to learn and grow. Today, we have a renowned speaker, Dr. Jean-Marc Gathrove from Canada, and he will be speaking on biomechanics. Simple concepts makes big difference. Biomechanics has always been a very complex topic, and he will be deconstructing the topic through some amazing animated graphics. A warm welcome to you, uh, uh, Dr. Jean-Marc. 
Special thanks to the intellectual manpower behind the show, Dr. Puneet Batra, as usual, flawless, Dr. Uday, uh, Dr. Sanjay Lab, the man who's going to be coordinating the event today, Dr. Srinevi, the Honorary Secretary, always supporting and uh, being the force behind the show, Dr. Kalyani Trivedi, thank you for the wonderful rendition of the invocation, and Dr. Divya Roop, the uh, unseen person behind the show. Wishing you all a great evening of learning by the distinguished speaker who will spread the light of knowledge on areas of darkness on biomechanics. Thank you. Jai Avas. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, President, sir. Thank you for your uh, always smile and your welcoming words. Uh, well, may I request the Secretary of the Indian Orthodontic Society, Sri Devi, madam, to speak a few words, please, ma'am. A very good evening to one and all, uh, President Indian Orthodontic Society, past President Jayde, sir. It's so nice that you could join us here today. Vice President Dr. Surekhan Das, President-elect Sri Krishna Salsani. And of course, thank you, Dr. Sanjay Lab, for coordinating this. Uh, Dr. Puneet Batra and Dr. Uday, who are coordinating uh, the of this program today. Um, I won't take up too much of time because I think uh, uh, Dr. Mark Rutro has a very tight schedule. I believe he has another webinar today. Uh, but I think it's extremely appropriate that on the eve of Saraswati Puja, when we are trying to seek knowledge, uh, we have a webinar like this, which promises to give us more knowledge on this. It's also very appropriate that we've started off with such a beautiful invocation. Kalyani, thank you so much for that. And uh, without further ado, I hand over to Dr. Puneet uh, to introduce the speaker for today. And uh, I must say, we are all looking forward to listening to him. Thank, Thank you, you so much, ma'am. Uh, well, everybody is definitely waiting for the words of the speaker. And I'll just be very, very, I'll just be very short. Dr. Dean, uh, Mark Retroway has done his DMD in 1978. Well, I was only five years old at that time. So I must say that, you know, he is the most experienced person I have read literature on. He was, he's got an orthodontic certificate and master's in science at the Boston University. He is the director of the orthodontic division at the McGill University in Montreal, Canada, the chair of the Department of Orthodontics, University of Missouri, Kansas City. So somebody who has the knowledge, somebody who's got the experience and somebody who has molded over such a long period of his innings in orthodontics. It's a real pleasure, sir, to have you on board. I welcome you. Please take the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the organizing committee to uh, invite me on such an important day. I feel a little bit humbled, you know, for such a being at the uh, an Indian holiday and people still tune in to listen to me. It's very, I mean, I'm very happy and proud. So I will start at immediately. <clears throat> what I did is I just changed slightly my, my title. I call it revisiting the basic concept of biomechanics because I think uh, all the orthodontists in India, as we were talking during the introduction, pretty much are very versed in biomechanics. Some countries are less, some are more, but I would bet that India is, with all the mathematicians you have and all the smart people are pretty much at the top of the biomechanics world. So hopefully you can learn a little bit from me. Uh, anything that you have any questions, please use the chat. I will uh, open it up right now. If I could, I don't see it, uh, but anyways. Uh, so that's my office in Kansas City. I'm now the chair of the, uh, and I consider myself an orthodontic teacher. That's what I do. I, I don't. I've stopped practicing a year ago. Now I use my skills, we call it the way to teach uh, residents and uh, I teach in many countries and I really appreciate it. My passion is 3D printing, 3D everything. We, I use many software, see I, got, I, use on, I work on four screens in my office and uh, we try many, many things. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, able to participate in, in, despite my advanced age, to participate in uh, in uh, the orthodontic revolution as I call digital orthodontics. But it doesn't mean that we should um, forget or that the uh, <clears throat> orthodontic was basically, has been with us for many, many years. And we need to understand the concept of biomechanics uh, in a very, very, I would say, either simple, but unfortunately it's very complicated because what we always 
forget, we do a lot of Newton mechanics. You know, we use Newton as a base for our teaching where we use uh, forces, moments, but we also need to be able to understand that there is the bomb and there is a response of the body. Uh, this is constantly changing. The patient response is very variable. So I'll show you a little case in, in a minute that you have to be appreciative of how you can manipulate the bone and it's very complicated. So I, I, my, my mentor for the biomechanics is Dr. Burstall and Nelson. But I was trained by Dr. Gianelli, who always, he was a PhD in biology. So for him, the bone was very, very important. So as an example here, if you have the center resistance of a tooth somewhere, it could be a bit higher, but it's, you know, center resistance. And if you start having a little bit of bone loss, immediately you can see that your surface of bone de decreases. And what moves teeth actually are not really forces, it's more pressure. So if you decrease the amount of bone, obviously you will have a less, uh, a smaller surface and you increase the pressure. So when you treat patients, uh, all the patients always keep this in mind that the bone response is very variable from patient to patient. And please take the time to really make a good assessment of the architecture of the bone before you, you, you plan your biomechanics. Really important. So what do we do with bar mechanics? Well, we play with forces. If you, if you look at the textbooks, Dr. Choi, Dr. Burstone, Dr. Pusey, all these great people that did a lot of biomechanics, one of the problems that we have and they had when they did all this research was basically we study a lot in 2D, which is okay. But nowadays, hopefully, I think we are on the verge in biomechanics to go into the 3D world and eventually be able to better understand when we move teeth, what's happening to the environment, biological response, force dissipation, all these things that we still do not quite understand to this day. So I'm just gonna make a very quick um, review of what is simple force. So we usually use grams for a force when we apply a sprain to a tooth, but for whatever reason in orthodontics, we use ounces for elastics. So we have both, both systems in the United States anyways. This is a very important aspect of what people don't quite still understand is when you vary the point of application of the force, which is this point right here in space, you will get vastly different results of your mechanics. So be very careful when you plan your cases to apply the force at the most appropriate position, and then you will get much better results. The line of action of the force is basically also this line here where the force is activated. And again, if you vary the angulation of the force, let's say you're going down this way, well, you will have the same point of application, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what you want, the line of action of the force will be different. Best example here would be a class two elastic that you would use, which has the same point of application of a regular force, but because it has a different line of action, will have vastly different effects on the body. The direction is where it's going to, which is okay. And the magnitude is how much uh, force you will decide to apply. So all these are very complicated because as an example, the magnitude uh, forces vary depending on your type of mechanics, but also vary in time. The best example would be a power chain where you have a high magnitude of force for the first 48 hours, 36 hours, and then slowly, slowly the magnitude diminishes. So that's why we have invented uh, night eye core springs that give you supposedly a magnitude of force that is constant throughout uh, the visit the, between the patient visits. So all these concepts are pretty simple, but they are very important to the rest of my lecture. So that's the line of action. You can see that you can use a coil spring right here. So the line of action of this spring would be here. It's attached here. So you have now this force on this tooth and it's transmitted to the tooth through the bracket with all sorts of advantages and disadvantages. But at the moment, it's related to the fact that you have a fairly stiff wire and you have also 
a good engagement into the bracket, which will give you a force system that is semi-favorable, could be better, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So the line, different line of actions, I'll pass on this one, but this is important because nowadays what we have a lot of TADs and the TADs are giving us different uh, line of action. So let's say you want to retract with the, uh, an incisor. And if you have a molar tube right here, you would pull from the bracket to the molar tube with the force F2, which will give you a certain line of action that will be transmitted to the center resistance of the tooth. And you will have, <clears throat> sorry, if you take the same force and you put a pin right here, let's imagine that you put a little pin and then you put a tad at a higher level you, and you apply the same force, you will not have the, uh, first pins raise their hands, wait a minute. Uh, I don't know, how can I get to the chat? Uh, please, please go ahead. Uh, we will handle the chat later. Oh, okay, no, sorry, because I thought I, they couldn't listen to me or something. I was speaking too fast or something. So that's the tad. And obviously, people don't understand that if you tie the tad to a pin, you will get a certain force to the center resistance. But I've seen a lot of people saying, I put a tad and I pull from the bracket, which is not a bad idea. Don't get me wrong. But you will get a different system. This force here, which has become, I don't know, F2 prime, will not have the same action on the tooth that this force. So be very careful when you, even if you use TADS or whatever you put your, your mechanics, be very careful of what you want to achieve with your mechanics. And it has to do with the line of action and the amplitude of the force. So this, I'm going to, and the bone again, I just told you that um, <clears throat> a, a, before that, what you really want to do nowadays, we try as much as possible to use primary bone resorption and avoid hydronization. So it means is you're trying to apply your force on a constant basis, right on the bone as much as possible. So you have the best possible, uh, sorry, uh, surface. And this way you decrease root disruption and you actually speed up tooth movement. Unlike what people think, it's not so much the amplitude of the force, it's the way you apply the force and the way the root will be pressing against the bone that will make a difference. So sometimes increasing the force is not the best idea. So I just show you a quick case here for the biological response of a fairly simple orthodontic case, but it's a more of an involved periodontal um, uh, patient that had some issues with bone loss and what happened, we had this over eruption of incisors and it gave her this kind of a, of a smile, which was not very aesthetic. And all we tried to do, and the periodontist wanted me to do some tooth movement to help regenerate the bone, which actually we can help uh, with very light forces, well adjusted. So what we did is we went from here to here by just doing very simple orthodontics, you notice that the tooth on the lower arch is still misplaced because the patient just wanted to have limited treatments, which we did on the upper arch, we never touched the lower. And how we did, did we do that? In, and this was the situation at the beginning of treatment. So the bone was there. So what you need here is really to be able to intrude these teeth very, very slowly into with a line of action that is predetermined. You just cannot put a ton of force. Otherwise, you will intrude the teeth, but you will lose the bone. So you have to intrude the teeth with very, very light forces. We also had a defect here that we addressed. But the idea was done again with this uh, solution, this more interesting here. What we did, we did a segmented approach, meaning that we had a segmented wire. At the beginning, it was only the two front teeth. We just did segmented for the two front teeth and we directed the force exactly with this secondary wire. We only put about 20 grams of force, less than 20 grams of force per tooth. So it looked like almost nothing. 
but you see now that the bone is actually forming again. So this is a very interesting concept that I've been applying in periodontics for many years is the concept of very, very light forces. And people say, oh, we, we can use nickel titanium wires for that. Nickel titanium wires do not give you 20 grams of force. They will give you much more than that. So you have to be careful. And again, you can see great result with night night eye also, but with sound bar mechanics, pure intrusion and very, very slow. You have to be patient and tell the patient this is going to take a while. Very slow movement, you have remodeling of the bone. So never forget that we, we work in bone and all biomechanical concepts are interesting and important. So what do we use? We use a Cartesian coordinate of, 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 uh, of the force with a line of action right here. And if you have the force, people talk about translation. They always, when we talk about translation in orthodontics, we always think that it's the canine being going from this position to this position. So that's translation. But at the end of the day, it's not really that. Translation occurs anytime you have a force going through the center resistance, right to the center resistance, regardless of the line of action. So in a case like this one, oh, sorry, I forgot this. If you put any, this force will bring this tooth up to here and it will move the tooth bodily, which is very interesting when you can do that, when you want to intrude the incisors without changing the angulation. Obviously, if you want to change the, uh, the uh, inclination of the tooth, you have to add, as we call it, a moment. We'll talk about that in a minute. And depending on the inclination, you have a force system. It's not a single force anymore. So the force system is what we do every day in orthodontics, except we vary the force and we vary the moment. And by varying the, the moment to force ratio, we'll talk again, but that moment to force ratio will have the movement we want. But remember, we have 28 teeth to deal with. So it's not as easy as it sounds. And we deal also in 3D of space. So that's very complicated. <laughs> so you can do this and you know mathematics. So I'm not going to bug you. But this is the force I'm applying to the tooth. But how can I do that? Well. The best way in orthodontics to do it is to put a horizontal force, which I will call X1. And what happens is you pull from this direction and you can put a Y2, which is a vertical force. And you can get the resultant force that you want, depending on the, I would say, uh, desired result. I was just reading an article yesterday from Dr. Nanda, and actually now they, he was talking about the extrusion arch, but this time what he does, he put a Y2 prime, which is actually vertical. So then you're gonna get a, this type of movement. So you can vary the force. <clears throat> this is very also interesting because the straight wire system, which is a very good system and I, tend, I use it a lot, many times will give you a very good control on X1 and not so good on Y2. So your force system becomes a little bit more complicated. And you have to understand that you, you need to compensate the fact that the straight wire system doesn't have Y2 and will give you um, uh, will give you a bit more difficulty by, to control the teeth if you only use X1. So what happened is now we, we used a lot of shape-driven systems where people will tell you, well, all you need to do is do wire sequence. Uh, that's it. You just put the brackets on, you change the wires and you wait until the teeth magically uh, align. And it happens in several cases, especially for moderate malocclusions. But wires are not smart. Wires will deliver forces and they will do all sorts of things. And as we said before, we have the bracket, the wire, the center resistance of the tooth is up there somewhere, and the force system is not at the center resistance. So what happens, you have some, sometimes, especially in a case like this one, you end up with uh, effects that you are not really wanted. And many people will not understand, especially on this picture here, where you see the lingual cusp have been dropped by the wire, the, the, the fact that the wire was actually tipping the teeth and people will say, oh, that's not a problem. All I need to do is 
put some elastics here and I will close the bite and they don't understand why it's not happening. It's because the system now is in balance and what you need to do actually, you have to reverse the mechanics. So what do I mean by that? If you put an elastic on the buckle, you will be trying to put this force here on the buckle. Actually, what you need, you need a lingual force. So you have to put a lingual force and not a buckle force. So if it happens to you, it sometimes happens to every one of us that the teeth start to tip buckly. That's my first little trick of the day. Do not try to solve the problem with um, buckle elastics because you will actually not have great success. You may, if it's not too severe, you may end up, you know, being able to uh, get some some re some result. But you have to reverse the trend because what is needed. You always apply the force that is needed. And in this case, the force that is needed is actually a lingually and um, I would say apically directed force. So use the correct force, use the correct magnitude and use the correct direction. Just a little case I'm gonna show you here. So this patient has significant uh, protrusion, has overbite, She's 17 years old, she's not growing, she has some, some issues. And I'm not gonna show you the whole case, I'm just gonna show you the force application as a, uh, an, an example. So you can put brackets, obviously. And you can try to extract some teeth, maybe this one, and start retracting. So if you have only F1, even if you have a rectangular wire, we all know that it's hard to open the bite it's hard to retract because really you have to imagine where the tooth is going from position one to position two somewhere. And actually the tooth wants, has to go up, has to rotate. And this is hard to do if you only use F1 because F1 will tend to distalize the tooth and it will tend to actually turn it the wrong way. So that's not what you want to do. So what I use many times, and I've been showing this, and I, I like this setup, uh, could have done better. I'll show you what the error I made. Uh, it's a small error, and I fixed it after. Uh, so what we do, we still use a straight wire. You could use, uh, you could use a, an intrusion arch of Burstone, no problem. But a lot of people don't like these intrusion arches. So I, I kind of developed a different technique that people can, even if they don't are not too crazy about the second wire, they, they can live with it. And what it does, you can see immediately that what we do, we just basically use the rectangular wire here to have some control of the torque, but, and we also retract the, uh, retract the, uh, sorry, the, the canines, but we put also a force. So just a little trick I'll, I'll show you. So I use this very simple, um, piece of stain uh, of 016, I think, uh, um, Wilcox wire, it's called Wilcox, or you can use stainless steel, but this is a better, uh, it gives you better elasticity. And what you do, you put the wire here, you measure the force that you will get, so it's called activation, and the deactivation will go in the reverse, obviously. And what happens is you will get a vertical component and you can get a horizontal component, very good. And you can also control a little bit of the torque this way, depending on what you want to do. The only error I made, and I've been correcting this uh, since then, is it's better to tie sometimes here. If you want to have less proclination, you can tie the wire here. You can tie it here, so you can tie it here. So if you have position one, position two, position three, and they will give you different application of the vertical component of force. So it means that here, the same force will be here. Let's assume the center resistance is there. This one will be here, same force, and this one will be here. So you can see that the line of action of the force in relation to the center resistance will be different and you will have different effects. So I'm not going to go too much into these because it takes a long time to um, be able to uh, understand this, these concepts. I've done the same on the lower and what I'm doing on the lower, I am actually uh, controlling the vertical and you can see that we went into, uh, sorry, this position 
to this position in less than 12 months, which is pretty good. So I'm going to show you a little thing also on bracketing because I think people do not quite understand the concept sometimes is here, when you want to bracket teeth, you have to make a decision on, do you use a Roth prescription? Do you use an MBT prescription? So it's moving, so I'm gonna to have to write on the side. Okay, so this is super important for you to make sure that you position the brackets correctly, but also that what happens is if your brackets are not what they're supposed to be, you will not get the correct movement. So this is one of the most neglected part of orthodontics. People tend to say, oh, bracketing, I can bracket a case in 20 minutes. It's not a problem, but I'm gonna stop this so I can just make a little, uh, where can I get it? Yeah, okay, did I stop it? No, oh, sorry, go down a little bit. Okay, so I think, yeah, that's better. All right, so in 12 months, so the brackets here are placed, I use the Roth prescription myself. So they are at four millimeters. If you use the MBT, you'll be slightly higher, but be very consistent in your bracketing and make sure that if the brackets are not positioned correctly, you will just re-bracket. So this patient here being 16 years old, I don't expect any growth. So the plan is to slightly procline the incisors here, not too much, just a bit, just control the incisors, control the vertical, and mainly take this, this tooth from this position here to this position. But again, this is only 12 months in treatment. So we still need to intrude the tooth a bit, intrude a bit and, uh, sorry, intrude in a bit and retract a little bit this tooth. So that's still there. I still maintain the space on purpose because uh, what happens too is a lot of people try to retract the teeth. So overjet, which is the overjet reduction, which we all like to do, usually comes after overbite. So please always, always maintain the, the, the vertical control before you, you have an overjet correction or final overjet correction, because right now what I'm doing with this patient, you see I'm retracting, you can see the, the spring here because I have some overjet and I also have a vertical vector of force. So I have a vertical vector, I have a horizontal vector and I'm getting this kind of a movement, which is what I want. So every month you can adjust. And sometimes I will stop the horizontal vector just to let the vertical vector um, get uh, totally um, expressed until you get what you want. So sometimes slowing down the retraction of incisors or canines will actually end up giving you a better result at the end. So I'm going to go back to simple concepts, simple force applied to the crown of the tooth. So what happens is you always have this problem of having the force here and you cannot really position the force someplace else because again, you 90% of us, or maybe 99, 95, I have no idea, work in the straight wire system, which again, it's not a problem. It's just a fact of life because it's convenient, it works well, but it has some significant issues that you have to address. So the, the first one is the line of force doesn't go through CR, which may or may not be a problem, but in many of our uh, situations, it is. So what happens is to calculate the system that you have to deal with is you take the force and you add an opposite force on the other side and you add this force here. And what happens is now you have this system. And if you look at it, now you have two systems. One is the force, hep, and this one is a force couple. So what it does, it tends to rotate. And that's the way Dr. Burstone was describing it very nicely because then he says, okay, I'm gonna take this force couple and make it into a moment, which is that. So that's the famous calculation of Dr. Burstall moment to force ratio. Where you see the other, on the other slide, there was moment equals force times distance. We all know that. So what happens is when you put a force right here on the, uh, at the bracket, well, it is 
found again at the center resistance. So there is a distalization force, obviously, but because of the distance, you create this moment here and the moment to force ratio equals the distance. So D equals M divided by F, which is usually in uh, an incisor about 10 millimeters. So people will say, oh, it's a force ratio of 10. So the moment to force ratio is 10 and that's it. And then a lot of times I quite, couldn't quite understand what it meant, but this is what it is. So what you have is you have a force that is actually pushing or pulling the tool, the tooth distally while it's, it wants to rotate it in a counterclockwise rotation with a moment to force ratio of 10. And we'll see that later on. It's called uncontrolled tipping where the tooth is going backwards, but it's also rotating. So yes, when you have uncontrolled tipping, by the way, the standard resistance is moving distally. It's not just rotating. So this is what we want to do here is you can also, the second system is to get a force couple or how can you get moments? Well, when we do a famous, you know, you have a nail in the wall like so, and you want to pull on it, you can pull on it this way, but it's very hard to do. So you, you do what we call mechanical advantage, where you put this tire system or, and you push here at a distance. And what happens, you, get, you, get, you will get the nail to get out really much easier because you have this uh, couple that tends to push the tooth, uh, the, 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 the nail much easily. So with teeth, you can do the same thing. How can I rotate this tooth by getting a beam and I'm pushing on the beam and what happens because I'm at a distance from the center resistance, I will get F times D, which will rotate the tooth significantly. But it will also, this force F will still come here. So the tooth will extrude and rotate. You have to understand that too. It's not pure rotation. Something that is important to understand is the tooth will rotate right here around the center of resistance, not right here. This is where you put the moment, but the moment will express. It's a free vector. So a moment or force couple of free vectors, and they do not get applied where we want. They always go to the center resistance of the tooth. And I'm sorry, my writing is really horrible. I'm gonna try to do better. Let's do better. Force is a regular vector. A moment is a free vector. So that's a big difference that people don't tend to understand. And that's why we have issues when we uh, get the torque because people think that the torque is expressed to the bracket and it's not really expressed to the bracket. It's transferred to the center resistance and you have to kind of have a different force system if you want the tooth to be rotating around its bracket. So you can also apply torque this way, we'll know that, we'll do this every day, where we twist the wire, you activate the wire into a bracket that has a specific torque value right here, alpha. So the bracket has a specific torque value, you activate the, the wire and the wire will deactivate and the tooth will follow through the center resistance. And that's the, we call that third order bend. So we do this all the time with uh, our a rectangular wires and it works really well, but it also has some significant side effects that you may uh, have encountered. But today is not a torque lecture, so I will just leave it at that. But that's the second way. So the first way was to apply a beam. The second way is to torque the teeth through uh, a torquing motion into or a twisting motion into the wire. So let's see the differences now with a little movie. Let me try to explain. And this here represents, this here right here represents the center of, uh, of rotation, which we'll see in a minute. So how to calculate the center rotation. So the center rotation is part of what we do every day. So if you put the center rotation like I just showed through this flap, you have uncontrolled tipping. If you go through the bracket right here, so if the center rotation is right here, you will get a torquing motion where the crown goes a little bit distal, but the apex goes mesial. So that's what we call torque. 
And torque is really important in orthodontics because we have the center of rotation at the bracket. And I'll show you, it needs a special force system. One of the um, important aspect of if you just twist the wire now, if I twist the wire, what happens? So even if I twist the wire into the bracket, this is what happens. So you can see that the apex is going towards the buckle, but the, the uh, crown goes lingual. Or if you do the reverse, if you had a class two division two, well, you would have to, uh, you think that you're torquing here, but the tooth is still, let's say you have a class two division two for a minute here. I'm gonna to try to draw the tooth, class two division two. Some kind like this. And you say, I'm gonna apply some torque to this so I can basically get the apex where I want to go. So you apply some torque right here. And you would think that in many people think that the torque is applied here, but in reality, if you only apply the torque, the torque will be applied to the center resistance. So this will come this way and this will come this way. So basically you have a force couple right there, okay? And what you need to do basically is to counteract the movement. If you don't want a force here, you put a little force there. So then these two forces will cancel each other and you will get what you want. So if you want to torque, that's another trick I give you. If you want to torque the teeth and only or limit the, the movement of the, the crown, what you need to do is to put the torque in the bracket or put a beam, whatever you want. But please remember, you need to add a force in the other direction at the crown level. And what will happen then by balancing these two forces, you will get the movement you want, which is F from here. And if you really do a good job of it, you will have zero movement of the crown. Or sometimes you say, well, I can afford to have the crown come forward a little bit, which happens many times. So what you do, you just reduce the force. So you have a smaller force on this side and a bigger force on this side, and the tooth will slightly change the center rotation. And what will happen is you will get the desired movement. So that's very, very important. Okay, let me check where I am right now. So you can see this is uncontrolled tipping which we do all the time. And this guy here, I wanted to show you. So that's what happens when you do, you put a force on at the bracket level. And we all think that we're torquing just the apex, but we are not, all right? That's very, really important. So that's what I do here. I used a torquing arm. Very simple. In this case, I wanted the teeth to come forward a bit because the prosthodontist wanted to make bigger teeth. So what I'm doing now, I'm letting the torque express at the center resistance on purpose. And I'm putting a very light force right there. Very, very, very small force. Because I'm also then I'm pushing here activation. So this force here will tend to lift this, which I don't really like, but this is something you need to live with. So you always have action reaction. And what happens at the level here, you will actually have a torquing motion that will express at the center resistance. So this incisor will come forward. If I did not want that, I could tie this teeth to here with a piece of ligature wire and put a class two elastic or something, whatever, doesn't matter to hold everything. So this force here will actually result into a torquing motion around the bracket and not so much around, uh, sorry, the other one. I need to put a force this way. I made an error, I do apologize. So I need to put a little force this way here that we counteract the movement and then you get a pure torquing motion. So that's really important when you do class two mechanics, class two division two, where you want to avoid having excess overjet created. These are very, very good systems and they work really nicely. So that's the case. So what I'm doing now, I'm just letting 
the torque is finally expressed with the, the wire. I'm waiting for the prosthodontist to tell me what he wants. And at the end of the day, we ended up retracting these teeth a little bit more and intruding them a little bit more. So we went this way with a small, uh, a little bit of a, a difference, but the, he was happy, he felt that this space was a bit too much, so we had to close it, but it was nothing really complicated. So we had to kind of retract the teeth a little bit more and we had to get the midline into a better position, but that was finishing, not, nothing complicated. So basically what we did was we, we did 80% of the treatment and you see the, the lower teeth have, not, have been done the same. We just did with these torquing arms and they work really nicely, but you, again, you have to be patient. So creation of a force couple, how do you do that? Well, we'll see that in a minute. This is what you want to do. This is basically what you do with brackets all the time. This is why it's so important for the bracket to be correctly positioned and you just deform the wire by pushing on it this way and pushing on it. Everybody knows that and you get a moment or a force couple doing this, going this way and the tooth will rotate, meaning this part goes this way, this part goes this way. So that's a rotation around the center of resistance. All right, <clears throat> so what about equivalent force systems, which is something that a lot of people don't quite understand. We'll spend a bit of time on this. So two force systems are equivalent if they result in the same force and the and same resulting moment. So basically, the system is in equilibrium. So meaning you have the same force systems and you can do it many ways. You can either use a simple force, you can use a force with a moment, depending on where you apply the force, depending on how much force you put, you will have different results. So if you look at this little bracket again, straight wire system, very small wire, little pins, and the question we always have and ask my students all the time, which I'm sure you'll know the, the, the answer is, if I put the same force at three different positions, position one, position two, and position three, well, which one is equivalent? Well, one and two are equal. They're equivalent, but two is not. Because again, and that's something that is really interesting now, we use a lot of power arms, that's why I don't use too many of the um, and cantilevers and all complicated systems anymore because with power arms, micro implants, you can get very interesting um, uh, differences and simpler mechanics and it's totally true. We should not abuse them by the way, but they do give us some significant advantages. So this force F1 and this force F3 is actually equivalent. It will give you the same moment to force ratio, F1 and F, F3. So if you go to CR, F1 and F3 will give you the same force, but it will give you a fairly large moment because you have a, a distance from the center resistance. So the tooth will go back and rotate a lot. The same force applied, let's say four millimeters higher with a power arm will give you the same force, but this time, because the distance is much, much less, a much smaller moment, which has tremendous advantages on friction, on binding, on everything you can think of, because the moment here is smaller, the two still wants to rotate, but it's much easier to control. So power arms are very powerful nowadays. A lot of patients are getting them for Invisalign, sorry, for Invisalign because it's a really complicated, it's a very, very, uh, I would say, beneficial way of addressing uh, retraction, anything, because you can control the moment to force ratio by just changing where the force is applied. You can put it here, you can put it there, you can put it here, you can put it here. And every time that you do that, you keep the same force. The force is the same, but the moment changes. So that's really important. So one concept that is not well understood is center rotation. And again, it is a very short lecture. I don't have a ton of time to explain it to you, but we'll try that, okay? So what happens is every time you move a tooth, center resistance is here and here, 
Every time you move a tooth, and you, even if you translate, there is a center rotation, which is at infinity. But what happens is this one point goes this way, one point goes this way, one point goes this way, one point goes this way. But there is a point in space where there is a rotational um, movement and there is no translation. So that's called the center of rotation. And it happens everywhere and you have to develop it. So the way to do it, I'll show it to you in a minute, is an interesting one because especially for complicated cases, obviously you don't need to bother yourself with these, this concept if you're just leveling an arch with a little bit of crowding, this is not important. But when you start having teeth that are positioned in strange places that you need to really work at, understanding the center rotation is very important. So let's see if I can explain it to you with this video, hopefully. Uh, it's too long, so we're going to try to. So I think we did that already, so I'm not going to bug you too much with this. You see, that's what I'm saying. The center rotation now is at the middle of the tooth. But what you have here, you see, you have some proclined incisors that you say, OK, uh, if I move this incisor, let's say, with the center rotation right there, which is the resultant of a simple force. And if I move this tooth, you're going to see that the tooth is actually, the overjet is reducing, but the bite is closing, which is not what you want. So I say, that's not good. I said, maybe I could do better. Uh, OK, let's try something else. If I move the tooth, the, sorry, the center rotation to the apex, it's called control tipping. Well, now the tooth is great because the apex does not move, but now I even close the bite even more, which is even not, that's not good. We don't want that. Not on this case. In some cases, I'll show you, you want that. But in a case like this one, this is not a good idea. So what can I do? I can even try to go towards the trying to torque a little bit. Maybe I should put some torque in there. Well, the angle is better. The bite is not closing so much, but the overjet is reducing really low. And then what I'm, I'm doing is I'm actually moving the apex way too much. So if you want to retract the tooth, this is not, again, a good idea. So you may say, well, maybe the center rotation should be placed someplace else. But you say, wait a minute, I've tried all the spots in the tooth. So probably what we need to do now is to try the spots into uh, a different position. So I'm going to calculate the center rotation. And this is the tooth here in the back that you see is actually the position that I want. I want this tooth to go there. So that's position before and that's position after. So this, this crown goes from here to here. So that's the line. And this apex goes from here to there. That's the line. So that's the center rotation. We, we bisect the distance between the two. So we have this center rotation in 2D. It's very hard to calculate in 3D. And then you have the perpendicular. So what happens is the center resistance of the tooth is actually going to travel from the center resistance number one, which is right here. OK, so let's wait for the movie to play. So that's the center resistance number one. It will travel, uh, tra translate to the center resistance number two. So that's where the force goes, the translation force goes there. This is the line of action of the translation force. But we have a problem because the tooth needs to rotate also. So there is a need for rotation. OK? So what, how we do that? Oops, sorry, I'm going to remove this because now I'm changing the video. OK? So now I'm going to say, OK, let's try to see if I put the center rotation where we calculated it a minute ago, and it's about there, it's hard for this software to, to do it. So I just did it by memory, but it's roughly, you know, it's roughly there. So let's see the center rotation, what happens. If I can move the center rotation, all of a sudden the tooth does almost, I could do better, but almost what I want, which is this now becomes the center rotation. So that's where the tooth will rotate, as you could see, around its axis and gives you the exact movement without any round tripping. So the, the deal is how can I, uh, let me close, shut this down. Uh, okay. Sorry. 
I don't know if I can do it. Sorry, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> okay, that's good. I'm not going to play the movie. Okay, so what we had here is this tooth axis here wants to rotate and go backwards this way. So it's, it's translating this way along this line of action, which we found that out and it needs to rotate. So we have this center of rotation right here. So we're happy. So it tells us that now the rotation has to be in this direction. And how can I get an equivalent force system for this? Again, today's is a short day. So what I need is a, is a simple force. So the simple force is given by this. Let's assume I put a simple force F is here, F is there. If I was able to put a simple force at a distance from the line of action, so I have a second line of action that is parallel to the first one, which is line of action number one, line of action number two. And you say, if I could put this at a distance, well, I would have an equivalent force system. This force would give me the same force and it will give me this moment. So the trick is to calculate the distance, but that's a different way. And you say, okay, so what can I do? And my students ask me all the time, what can I do to do that? Well, there are many ways to do it. You can either get a force system with a horizontal force and a vertical force. So you get F, which is right here, which is kind of nice. Remember, this is good. So this is fine. And you could put some torque into the bracket. So that's one way to do it bit complicated because it's hard to control the moment to force ratio. So you have to adjust this every time. Or you can say, OK, and it's the famous uh, intrusion arch of Burstone, where you can see on Dr. Choi's uh, first page of his book is you can put a system right here and like this and some kind of little wire. So this is basically a passive wire. OK. And you have a tube here on the molar. And what you do, a double tube, you need a double tube. And what you do, you put a power chain to the molar. So you have an F here. And you put a piece of wire like this that ties. So what happens is, what happens basically now, you have now a force F like this. Actually, I made an error. I did make an error. I will retrace it in a second. Small error. I do apologize. Uh, I do there. I go here. I go here. I go here. And I go here. So this is the force F done by the elastic. So I got an F. And then I get a piece of wire that's pulling here. And I get the perfect force. So this here is called the intrusion arch of Burstone. You may have seen it. It works incredibly well. But it requires a bit more wire bending and it will give you exactly what you want. All you need to do is vary the point of application of the force according to what, where the tooth is going. So if it's tipping too much or it's rotating too much, you go, you go a bit farther from there. If it's actually going forward, or actually transiting too much, you can go closer and you get the better. Actually, you get, you get sorry, I'm in an error. You go farther if it's if it's translating too much, and you go closer if it's rotating too much. So that's that's the basic of why you need a system of uh, translation, um, and that is given you with a straight wire, as I said. Oh, come on, sorry, giving you a translation with, with this force right here. So you still need an upper force and a so you need X, as I said, you need Y, and you need some, this is the force, but then you also need some extra torque, usually, to make sure that the tooth is gonna do what it's supposed to do, okay? So that's why you need the center rotation. And it's very useful when you are going to be looking at canines like these. These are not too complicated, but sometimes they are much more complex. And everybody knows that impacted canines can be a real complicated matter especially for people who use a buckle approach to uh, impacted canines and try to tie little springs like this. It's really complicated. Uh, it, makes, uh, it makes the fitment really, really long. So using the center rotation of the tooth 
which is given to you and I'll show you in a minute. So I'm not going to draw it. Um, so what I did is exactly the same thing. I calculated the center rotation of these teeth. We did a lingual approach with some special hooks that were actually pulling the tooth in the direction we wanted. So we first pulled distally, then we pulled, uh, I think, uh, buccally. I can't remember the way it was done. And then obviously you can also marry this with, at one point, to marry this with regular brackets where you can then have a force system that is to your advantage because then you can put a force that is lingually directed and maybe one buccally directed and all of a sudden you have a force coupler. So the problem we have with uh, using only power threads and, and these to uh, position impacted canines is you do not create these force couples and you only have simple forces and you, you struggle with a simple force all the time because it doesn't always do what you want. So always remember, especially canines, you need a force, you need a force couple, and you have to kind of design it either with a ballista spring, anything you want. But remember that just a power thread only gives you this, which makes life a lot more complicated for you, for me, because I, was, I used to practice this way 25 years ago, and I had a big problem with my impacted canines until I figured it out. You know, I said, we need a better system. So I spent a bit more time. Yes, there is some link. Many times there is a palatal bar. Yes, the palatal bar is designed specific, specifically for each case, but this is the result we get, uh, which is kind of nice. Don't, don't uh, assume that. Well, this is what we do nowadays. We take the canines in gray, which is position one, which is D4. We put them into, in the cone beam, we put them in position two. And we calculate the center rotation, as I told you, which is right here. Remember, center rotation, right there. And then the center rotation, the electronic system will tell us, not on the center resistance, you see the center resistance here. So it's telling me here that I need this kind of a force system and I need a, I need a, a, a couple that I can, and it tells me that I should put a simple force at this distance on the lingual, and this tooth should go there. Is it gonna happen exactly? Not really, because the center is, rotation changes all the time. So you have to adjust, but you can see just by doing this cone beam and taking this tooth and putting it here, immediately you understand what you need to do, you know? So you could say, well, on this one, probably just maybe a power thread may work because on this tooth, it may be a simple thing to do, you know? Maybe the power thread on this one is good. Power thread on this guy may be a bit more complicated. So you may need a bit more complex mechanics on, on the right canine than even on the left canine. But by having these very compelling pictures, will allow you to have a much better idea of what's going on. And these are not poor bracketing. The cone beams are very bad to, uh, to pick up all these, but we don't care. It's just a matter for us to calculate what we need to do. This is really good. This is really good. So the uncontrolled tipping, I'm just showing you a little animation. You all need that, but there's something that needs to be said about this little movie is this. You always, always close the bite with uncontrolled tipping. The apex always comes mesial. You actually put a lot of pressure here and a lot of pressure there on the bone. So you have to make the call. Do I need this? If you have a perio patient, maybe be careful. You may not want that type of, uh, of movement, even if the force, because we always saw the force is low with tipping. You're absolutely right. But the pressure is pretty high because the amount of pressurized bone is very small. So do not think that because you have a perio patient, you should only use simple forces. I usually don't. I usually use uh, forces and moments to try to get the surface of a force application to be higher. So that's the deal. So be careful when you, when you tip the teeth because I see my residents do this all the time. They put a, a force that is too big they don't fill the slot as much as we think it does. There is still about 10 degrees of slot, and all of a sudden the tooth has retracted, but now the bite is closed. So be very careful with that. It's not easy to reopen the bite and it takes forever. So 
if the bite is not closed when you start the treatment and you don't want to close it, don't do it. Always move the teeth where they're supposed to go. If you want have an open bite and you want so the moment to force ratio we saw that i'm not going to spend too much time but that's exactly what happens with the uncontrolled tipping or position because again the line of force is away from the tooth all right that's totally correct and is it good or bad sometimes it's good in a case like this nine-year-old little kid that lost his primary molars well the the the, the molars that tipped immediately and all they want is to be tipped back. So this uncontrolled tipping force is fantastic. That's what you need. You don't want to be too fancy. You put a removal appliance with a heavy coil spring, you know, right here. <clears throat> Something like this. And you just push and it's very simple and you get a very fan fantastic result because that's what you need. But I would argue it does not happen so often in orthodontics anymore. But in this case, it was. So we did just uncontrolled tipping because that was the needed force. No problem. And this is where a lot of the issue with the articles come and people don't quite understand. They say, oh, the moment to force ratio for translation is 10 for a incisor and it's 12 for a canine. And that's it. And then it becomes a big mystery. So what it really means is the force here applied will create this moment. Okay. And because it's at, let's assume it's an incisor at 10 millimeters, you will have a moment here that is 10, 10, 10 times the force. So it's MF equals 10. And you say, okay, so what? Well, if you want to have translation, you need to have to cancel the moment or not create it. So you could also say, well, I could go from here with an exp expansion on the lingual, which has been, I've seen that done and I will pull here, which is mechanically very good. It's actually the best system, but unfortunately it's hard to do. So many times we don't do that. It's unfortunate because that'd be the best, the best detraction system you can think of. So this one goes and you say, okay, what happens is I want it to reduce. So the next, sorry, the next step is to take this uh, moment and to cancel it. So how can I do that? Well, the best thing to do, you have a counterclockwise moment here, right here. And you say, well, if I put a clockwise moment on the other side, equal and opposite, cancel. All I have the force system. Now it becomes a force F going to the center of resistance and I have a perfect translation. So that's why actually it's the counter moment that you have as equal to minus the moment, which is the reverse, and it has to be equal to 10. That's what a lot of articles do not explain to you, and it needs to be understood. So basically what you need to do if you use a straight wire system is put a 100 grams of force right here, and if it's at 10 millimeters, you will have to put a bend in the wire that when you bend the wire this way it will give you a thousand grams of force and this thousand grams of force will cancel the natural moment created by f and then you get pure translation that's why people say you need to put a full size rectangular wire when you retract the incisors or the canines because you have a need to control the torque and totally right. But what happens is, what happens is if I could have an equivalent force system where I would actually, with a micro implant, to get, get a little, little power arm up there. But this is created by this one, but this guy here, F prime, let's call it F prime, will create a much smaller moment, which is actually half the moment. 
So the big advantage of the power arm when you translate is then you need half the moment on the other side. Then the moment to force ratio is actually five. It's not 10 anymore. Why is it important? Because when you do that, you can reduce the force system, you can reduce the friction, you can reduce the torque you apply, and you get a much better retraction. So I would argue that think about it, the force system here, and I still use, by the way, retraction from the can from the uh, from here. Uh, it's the same thing. I still do it, but the power arms are getting more popular because they allow you to simplify very complicated, you know, closing loops and all these things if you just use power arms. And obviously, if you use a micro implant, it becomes really, really, really uh, beneficial because then you have no issues with um, less issues with the anchorage. And on top of it, you can reduce the amount of torque you put on the, on, on the wire because you still need it, by the way. Uh, if you're here and you're pulling from here, you cannot put a wrong wire there. It's a bad idea. The tooth is going to rotate anyway, so that's not good. Okay, You have to have torque here. You have to have torque control. Everybody gets that? Okay. So the equivalent force system I explained to you. So basically what I told you two minutes ago is the F force here. If you want this force, then you reverse the equ equivalent force system times D. So you need the same force. And this time you need a counter moment on this side. So this is equivalent one to the other. So we saw that before. Okay. So this always keep this in your mind. What you need to be able to move teeth, you need 90% of the time, you need a moment to force ratio. So I see this all the time and that drives me crazy. My residents say, oh, I put a small wire, but to speed up the treatment, I put it a power chain, so I close the space. And you see, look at the premolar. It tipped forward, this guy tipped back, this guy's tipped back, the incisors went up. It's a disaster. So basically you went from a very simple system here to this. And yes, the space is closed, but you're gonna spend a year just to upright everything and maybe you will get a lot of problems. Look, the premolars don't fit anymore and it's, it's not good. So again, do not retract teeth. Even if you put light forces, people don't understand. It says it's only a light force. I'm put a very small force I'm teasing the tooth back, but what you're doing, you're actually at the center resistance, putting this light force, but you're putting this moment. There is no magic. This moment will rotate the tooth, especially if the wire is very flexible because it will not resist. And you will get significant bowing of the, of the wire. So you will create these malocclusions. And then you take a year and a half to try to upright everything. And by the time you finish uprighting everything, the incisors are, have gone buckly. So the, the, the lesson of this very important picture from Dr. Choi's book is do not, do not create, recreate the worst malocclusion that you had before. You see on the left side, everything was straight, everything was nice. All they had to do was to go for a stiffer wire, maybe a power arm here, maybe not, whatever you want to do, and just retract the tooth. Even if you use the, the wire here with a stiff wire and you make you, you were careful, you still be pretty good. But this one was a bad idea. And it's a great picture. I love it. You know, I'm just showing you a very quick case of mine to show you that you can retract the canines of there. So they basically this one's better, but this one is pretty much buckle. And if you do a good job of using the, the mechanics I use. You will get this system here. You can use a power chain, which, uh, sorry, this. So this nowadays would be better off if you want to maintain the anchorage, would be better off by putting a micro implant here, power arm right there and pulling from here. Everything and put the same, the same spring right there as you can or power chain, whatever, doesn't matter. This is much better because you reduce the friction, you reduce the binding. The tooth is freer to move and obviously you're better on the anchorage and the moment to force ratio is decreased. And that's the case seven years later. So the patient came back for new retainers, which he didn't need, but he wanted them anyway. So we gave them new retainers and it was fine. So if you put the teeth straight, doesn't mean that it's going to happen on every patient. Everybody has relapsed by the way, but it was good to see that if you put the teeth into a correct angulation, they will stay this way usually, usually. 
It's not all, it's not true all, all the time. All right, a different twist. I'm gonna run out of time, that's okay. Different twist, how can you do that? Patient has a very nice glass tube, so it's very stable, but she has anterior crossbite, this tooth is in crossbite, she doesn't like a smile, all sorts of problems. She had braces before when they took, I think, an upper premolar, don't remember. So the, 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 the treatment plan is actually to kind of take these, this canine where it belongs, which is right here. Unfortunately, I cannot bring the upper arch forward, but I also need to correct the class, uh, class two to the uh, class two to the class one. So I need to protract this tooth, but look, the occlusal table is good. So we need to protract this tooth into a very much, um, I would say totally um, translation system. There is no, no uh, room for error. So, and this is an adult. So this tooth has to come to here. This tooth has to come to there and it's all translation. So how we do that? Well, the best thing to do, and that's what we got. So we were able to do it, as you can see, she still stayed class two a little bit, but that's at one point there is so much you can do, you know? So what happened is now what we do nowadays is we do two things. One is we use a, now I use a TMA wire. That's the shape of the wire I use. I will uh, use this. I will tend to let the tooth uh, slightly, uh, sorry, how do you call this? Disclude. I use a power, I will use a micro implant right here. And what I use is the system from McLaughlin, which is not an elastic because it's more, much more comfortable for the patients to clean and everything. Power chains are messy. So what I do, I use a flexible wire here. So this is flexible. And Every month you take this little trick, you turn it, you have to change it once in a while because it tends to break after a while. And every month you, you give a millimeter activation. And it's surprising that the tooth will come forward very easily. And this is what you get. So why? Because you're at the center of resistance almost perfectly. And yes, there is a slight, you see the tooth is slightly intruding because I could not get the perfect positioning. In retrospect, maybe having put the micro implant here would have been better. I would have had a better line of pull, but the periodontist gave it to me here. So that was the idea. You have to do this. It's very simple. It takes about 10 minutes to um, 10 minutes to bend this. This is an old case. Now I use a double tube on all my patients. So this would have been easier, but I like to go all above because I, this gave me a longer a longer arm and this has some flexibility and it works really well. So basically you use the flexibility of the wire and the fact that you reduce again, the moment to force ratio is almost nothing. So there is sliding, the sliding is much, much, much more, much easier. And as you can see, it worked really nicely. So control tipping is, a, is a, unfortunately something we don't quite understand, but we do a lot of control tipping without even knowing it in a sense that we retract teeth, especially when you have a, a bimax protrusion with incisors that are very proclined. So that's the buckle, that's the lingual. You can really do a good job of doing control tipping by just getting the, the crown to go this way and the apex stays in the same position. So that's called controlled tipping. How do you do that? Well, it's a bit of a different one. You still need to have, remember that if you only put a torque, the tooth will rotate around the center of resistance, right? So that's not good. You don't want that. Not for control tipping anyways. If you put the same moment uh, equivalent, the green, if the green moment equals the other moment here, you get translation. That's not what you want. So what you need is to get the center of rotation again to come down from infinity, which is a translation and go around the apex. It's impossible to get perfect. And what you need to do for that is you need to incorporate a small moment on the other side. So this is the force system you need. So you have the tipping force, which is the simple force. And then you put a counterclockwise moment on this case. And what will happen is the center rotation will migrate around the uh, apex and you will get control tipping. 
Let me see. So that's the calculations I gave you. So the purple moment is the resultant moment. And the tooth will actually travel. So the, the central resistance travels a lot, but the apex is stationary and the crown travels a lot. So this is really good because you also have nice pressure around the bone. The apex is not moving. So unlike uncontrolled dipping, you get a better physiological response usually. All right, so let's see if I have a movie for that. Is it a movie here? I have a movie for this. Oh yeah, it's here. So in a case like this, I'll show you the case in a minute. If I can play this thing, I don't know. I don't know where it is. I'm lost. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is basically the center rotation is right here. And you always see these patients where you have the canines which are overlapping. And if you put a straight wire system, let me check here on this one if I can. The biggest error I see people do is that because they have flexible wires. So what happens is the tooth actually extrudes, it rotates a bit, absolutely. And then these teeth come forward like crazy and you have, you have done a very significant amount of round tripping because a lot of times these teeth should stay where they are. You just want to move this one. So do not move teeth you don't want to move do not engage this teeth. It's a bad idea. All right. So you can wait for that. It's not necessary. You're working too hard for no reason. So what you need, actually, if you want it to be really smart, is again, put a little piece of wire here, a little pouch power arm, maybe a certain length, and pull from here. Even if it's not the perfect pull, and you put a little arm here, and you pull from here, you get the perfect control tipping setup, which is this. So what happens is when you put the uh, when you put the um, center rotation at the apex, this is what happens. Simple movement. Um, you see, you have nothing to do. Very simple. You're done. And then you can notice that these teeth have been moved, and then you can retract them. You can do what you want. You can bring. Oops, sorry. You can bring the, um, and then you also need a little bit of rotation, obviously. So you need to work on that, but that, that's okay. Because when you pull here, which is one of the side effects is the tooth will tend to rotate a little bit. So that's not as good as it could be, but you can, you can manage, you know, it's very easy to, uh, to kind of, um, it, it's very easy to get back. And then, then it becomes a straight wire case. That's it, you're done. So then you can put, I don't know, a, a, surgical hook or whatever you want. And you can go the incisors against the cane, whatever. This, this becomes your choice of treatment. But what you've done, you haven't round trip anything and it wor it's working really nicely. So control tipping is very, very useful for this kind of situation. You need a little bit of force and a little bit of torque, which is actually going the wrong way. It's, it's strange. The torque is actually going this way. You see, it looks like it's going the wrong way, which is bizarre, okay? But this is the way you need it, all right? So again, this was the look before of this patient. You can see the canines. And when we finished, everything was straight and nice and everybody was happy, okay? No problem. So that's, that's one very quick case. Uh, she was a surgical case. Uh, she had a, the chin was a bit recessive. And she had this very significant amount of overjet. But the, I'm using this case to show you the control tipping system. So the teeth are there. It's exactly what I showed you on the video. So they need to go up and this way, which is the perfect. And if you look at the line of force from there, it's the perfect system for a control tipping movement. So that's why I'm showing her to, to you. And yes, she will need Actually, the control tipping will tend to rotate the teeth this way, so we'll have to derotate them the other way. And this tooth, which is a small error, I should have put more torque on the on the on the on the finishing, which I forgot. I'll show you in a minute. So again, that's the overjet we have. So I'm preparing her actually for surgery. I want to make her into a full class two and and get her into a better system because she needed many bit of advancement. Uh, again, sorry, so that's her very, very, uh, you know, this needs to come down, this needs to come up, the curve is this way, so there is a lot of things to correct before the surgery, 
and she needs to advance about eight millimeters, <laughs> which is okay. We can do that. So you see, I don't have the pictures, but this is the result of control tipping. This is the day you see the very small wire I'm putting. That's unfortunately, I didn't take the pictures, but we use segmented mechanics here for control tipping to pull the teeth this way. And this one, you see, I didn't torque it enough. It should have been torqued a bit better. And these teeth now are engaged into the wire and I'm preparing her for surgery. And then she decided that she doesn't want surgery anymore. So then I'm stuck. So this is when she told me, uh, I was actually working on getting more overjet, which I stopped because uh, I actually protracted the molars into almost a class two because she says I will never go for surgery. So that I had to leave her in class two, which is unfortunate. But that's, you know, you can't win them all, as we say. But what I'm showing you the case is with control tipping, we're able to really get those canines in good position. And if you want to critique the system, is basically, absolutely, this canine should have been torqued a bit better. I didn't do a good job on that, but that's part of looking back at your cases and seeing, you know what, I made an error. But when you look at the face, and this should have... I, I thought of putting the distalizing the molars, but she, she was fed up and she says, I don't want braces anymore, I'm done. I said, okay, because you see, we uprighted the teeth really nicely. We uprighted this nicely. All I could have done was uh, distalize molars. And, but she said, no, I don't want this anymore. Please remove brackets. Okay. Can't win them all, as we say. <laughs> all right. So that's final, oops, sorry. That's the final treatment. So I did leave the incisors on purpose there because she didn't want surgery. So the chin is at the same place. There is not much more proclination, but you can see now that the case is much nicer and we did what we had to do. We didn't get the results orthodontist would want, but the patient wanted this result and got it. And she's super, she was super happy with it. So that's okay, I guess. So that's the case before and after. And uh, sorry. Oh, that's one very interesting. And then we may, no, we're good. We still have time. So that's another surgical case. You can see that. Uh, we decided also because you needed so much advancement and it was in crossbite to do a SARP. So we are going to be doing a SARP here. And I wanted space to get those teeth in. I didn't want to extract any teeth. I tend to avoid extractions. And that's, that's the case. So what happened is after the SARP, you can see it right here. So then the SRP has resulted in this massive opening. It's really nice. And I'm letting everything kind of relapse. So she, he was more open, which, and you see, opened up a little bit crooked and he went up this way. So that's always a problem. You don't, you can't win them all, as we said. So the SRP ended up giving me this cant of the occlusal plane right there. So I don't like that. And I said, well, now I got a problem because I have enough Slowly, I'm preparing the space for this canine. So I'm bringing this tooth back. I will bring it back to the center line, but I don't want the biggest error. So I'm going to see what I have here. No, the biggest error I could do is go straight wire now in here, in here, in here, and go all the way up there, all the way here. So this is going to come down and come in this way. I'm very good, but this is going to come up and it's already up. So I cannot do that. Otherwise, you have to. And my friends say, why, why don't you use elastic this way, which we could have done, mind you. We could have done some class, you know, some, uh, some cross elastics. But I don't know if I wanted to do it. I was still working on the lower arch uh, to uh, align it. So I was not too crazy about using elastics on a very small wire on the lower, because then what happens is you may end up tilting the canines this way. And I said, you know what? The lower arch is, is good. Leave it alone. So that's what we did. So in order to do this, we use what I call a dirty segmented approach, which is a straight wire. You see, a friend of mine says you cut. So what we do, we cut the straight wire. So it's a straight wire with a cut, basically. So we don't do a very complicated burst on mechanics and everything. And don't get me wrong, it's really good. But on this case, I, I felt I could get away with it uh, by just uh, using a straight wire, but this is a knife tie wire. I'm not, you notice there is no force on the teeth. I'm just letting this tooth come all by itself and it will, which is very strange. So what it's doing, it's coming on by itself and it's also correcting itself because the wire is putting a very light force right here. So it's really cool. You get exactly what you want without any force. 
people, people get a bit um, impatient and they put a power chain here, which is a bad idea because then all of a sudden you get this massive moment, the two step into the, the space and you end up having an issue. So I wanted a very small moment to kind of get the puzzle plane better, which I should have been a bit more patient. I didn't get it perfect, but it's better. And I certainly didn't want to have this tooth pull this tooth up. So I said, okay, forget it. I'm not gonna do this. So what I did is I used this simple piece of TMA wire, which has multiple bends. It's got to bend this way for some rotation this way. So I am I'm actually uh, bringing the root this way. So I'm making the root angulation better. There is also a mesial direction, uh, sorry, a lingual direction in the wire. So I need to, we need about 20 grams of force and there is torque build up. So it doesn't look like it, but there are like three different bends in the wire. And obviously you bend this nicely so the patient doesn't get in trouble. And I am pretty good. I'm pretty happy with this because it's very light force. I could have done it before, but I, I, I wanted to keep the, uh, the RP in there. And the patient was kind of fed up with it because he had some inflammation. So he says, so you see the, the position of the tooth now is right here. Okay. So I'm, I'm basically, again, using the center rotation to figure where the tooth should be going. And it's gone. So basically, we got it. You see, I didn't get, I was lazy. I should have waited a little bit longer. I still didn't get the perfect uh, angulation, and I could have. So what you can do now is use this little, uh, this little um, uh, secondary tube and put a little wire here. You tie it here, and you're going to drop the whole thing so it wouldn't take long, OK? So she was, he was ready to debend. And when I saw that, but he was kind of happy with it. He was fed up, and again, Sometimes, you know, this would have taken three, four months extra. He didn't see the, he didn't see the need. If you look at the face, yeah, there is a little cat, but we could do better, you know? So we were still wearing class two elastics at that point. So we're still waiting. We were still waiting for a bit of a resolution. And I tend to leave them a bit longer, especially surgical cases. So we get a better result. So root movement. It's a very large counter moment placed on the tooth. And what happens is this is what you need. You need this system. So as I told you, you need this, you need this moment, uh, which will give you this couple. So if you want to remove that one, you need this force. So it's a force system at the bracket. It's a moment and a force. All right. Very, very, very important. Why? Because this is what you get as a, uh, how can I say, as a um, result. All right, so if you want this movement, I hate my, my opinion and everybody's different. This is a class two division two. Many people would put bra brackets and they will end up with a ton of overjet and then they work hard and they say class two division twos are so difficult to treat because what they do, they recreate a class two division one and then they hope that the patient is gonna come and, and, and grow. I don't do that, I torque and I I work on these two teeth at the beginning of treatment. So I don't touch these ones and I will only position these teeth where I want them to go. And this is the result. Oh, sorry. This is what I want to say. So and then I will have to finish. I'm going to be late. So that's the idea. So if you can see, my wife gave me, uh, she said I was not doing a good job of it. Hopefully, you won't say that. But what I'm showing you is the tooth is right here, class two division two. So the tooth is right there. And the center rotation is actually here. Look, the center rotation is there. It's very far from the tooth. Okay, so that means there is um, a significant uh, amount of translation and some rotation, which is bizarre. So this is what you do. Look at the tooth. Oh, it goes up and it does not procline. You see? No, pro and I kept the lateral inside to show you there is no proclination. So what happens is you have to build a system to get the center of rotation to be where you want it to be. All right. So if you put then, oh, I sorry, I put the wrong movie. I do apologize. Uh, if you put, oh no, I'm good. I'm good. So let's say if you do it the, the conventional way, which is putting the center of rotation at the incisor level, you will get 
the alignment, but look at the overjet. Now you get a ton of overjet and you have to hope that the patient is gonna grow into it. So if you had an adult patient, if it's a kid, you can still do it. But if you have an adult patient that you, where you need to retract the canine and you need to do all sorts of things, well, sorry, it's still playing. I just need to stop it. So when you have an adult patient, sometimes you'll extract the first premolar or the second one, and you're going to take this into here. This will come into a class two. But the problem is if you, if you put this tooth into this position, it will take forever to bring it back, and everybody knows that. So what I do nowadays is I will do exactly this, is what I just showed you, sorry. What I just showed you is I will move the center rotation from the root all the way to the molar. And that's a force system that I could explain to you how to do that, but it's gonna take a little while and we don't have the time today. So that's what we did on this patient, friend of mine, Barry Glazer, gave me permission. So we went from this pink to this green. So we didn't create a little bit of proclination, but if we had proclined the tooth, it would have been here. So the whole tooth that would have gone this way. So the amount of overjet would have been a lot more. So that's not good. And this is the, I'm the center rotation is actually at the crown level in this case, because there is a significant force, which is actually going distal, which is bizarre. And you put a moment and that's what you need. So you have to, to, to uh, work with the force system. Okay, and that's what you got, sorry. So the last little part and I'm done in two minutes is you want sometimes to do these simulation, which I do a lot nowadays. So this patient now I'm looking at, she has some, again, a class two division. Uh, she's very class two skeletal, has, no, has very short ramus. she has TMJ issues. And I'm, I'm not too sure if I want to extract teeth or not, because if I look at the case, I said I should extract because of uh, midline deviation and I need to, but let's see if I could pull it off with some segmented mechanics. If I could get this tooth to come into position, dropping the tooth, the same system as I use on the other patient, getting a cantilever here to pull the tooth, uh, to pull the midline and see if I could do it. And it looked okay. It's not perfect because simulation, it's, that's a quick simulation, but it looked, yeah, I, I think I can make it happen. It's not perfect. You need some IPR here. It needs some work, but I think we can probably give it a shot, okay? So that's what I did. Uh, we tried to, I simulated the, the, the treatment. This guy, I did, okay, let's see now if I was gonna, if I was gonna be, um, I need to get the sound off on this guy. Okay, so this guy here. So now I'm looking at this and that's, that's another video. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm appearing on the left-hand side. So I'm looking now is, uh, that that's uh, that's not important on the bottom, forget it. So this is what I was looking for, the amount of molar movement if I was extracting teeth. And there was a lot of movement. So I said, Oof, I don't know, especially with this TMJ issue and everything, I wasn't too sure. But that was not the problem. So that's, that's basically what we needed to do, you see? That was a lot of, uh, a lot of molar movement because we just, you see, and the incisors were going back. So, this was, this was the problem also. You see the amount of the protraction on this side, I didn't like at all. I said, this is gonna take forever and ever and ever because she, I could not retract the incisors as much because of the facial features. So I said, well, okay, this is not torqued correctly, but that's not a problem at the moment. This tooth here needs more work. So I was just having an, an idea. So that allows me to see, and I can play with this tooth and make it better. And all these things we can do and, you know, and torque it and do better, you know, do a bit of control tipping. So I can play with this and kind of imagine what I want for my treatments to, to arrive. And, and that's basically what we did. Sorry. And this is the case finished. So we were able to, uh, sorry, if you see it from the front before, this was before. I have no time to show you the whole case, but you see she has this very, very little ramus. She didn't want surgery. This is tiny, tiny. She has a massive MP angle. 
So normally I should have extracted teeth, but because of the amount of translation that I had to put into the molars, I decided against it. So yes, she stayed a little bit, um, you know, ellipse is not great, but she looks good. And she was very happy with the result and we were able to align the dentition and look at the tissue. So I would argue that, you know, people say, if you do this, you're gonna, you're gonna have some issues. And again, why we did it this way was using a very simple cantilever here, which is very, very nice. It's a little round thing and you tie it to the wire and you put 20 grams of force. Don't, don't do this with massive night tie wires. You will have probably uh, the same result, but you may get, you have to let the tooth travel to the bone or with the bone as much as possible. So I don't know if you like this short introduction to, um, to uh, um, sorry, the, um, my course. And I thank you for your attention. I do apologize. My slide didn't work as well as it should. And I thank the, the organizing committee. It's been really, really nice to invite me. And hopefully, uh, I didn't give you too much of a headache in this festive time of the year. I apologize for this uh, very fast-paced and, and maybe a bit overbearing mechanical lecture at night on a Saturday. My apologies. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. It was not at all boring. There is no. It was great lecture, great lecture, and all the animations, the, the in-depth explanation, and you really took us this biomechanics into 3D world, which is 3D, but by default, our mind read it in 2D, and we have read it on the books, on the papers, so it is always 2D. So uh, thanks a lot from our side, from all, it, uh, all the members of Indian Orthodontic Society for enlightening us on this topic of biomechanics. I know you are you have another webinar just I will take five minutes of you. We have yes. some past presidents, some eminent our orthodontists from our country here. They were kind enough, they graced the occasion to listen to your lecture and would like their remark on this. So I request let me please uh president well, I'm sir, happy I'm reading the chat. Sir. Uh, I'm reading the chats and uh, thank you for the Indian orthodontists. They are tough people because to, to swallow all this in an hour and a half. <laughs> we are not tough people. We are very soft people. <laughs> My residents would have killed me at halfway through. <laughs> this is a tough lecture. This should be a whole day lecture. But I usually do it in a whole day, by the way, because we have exercises. Yes, we would, we would like you to again give a lecture in physically live with us sometime whenever possible. So I request Jade sir, sir, if you, President sir, can we have Jade sir? He is not visible to me. Uh, anyway, Dr. Karbanda sir is there. I could see. Not with Karbanda sir. Yeah, so, so Jade sir left. Karbanda sir. sir. Jade, sir so not. I request sir. Also oh. his left eye. Okay, okay. So I, I request. Professor Karvanda, sir, to kindly. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, I can say that uh, having been in this, uh, listening to the biomechanics for last for 50 years, rather, uh, 40 years, uh, this is one of the most interesting way of presentation and understanding. And actually, every time I listen to biomechanics, I pick up something because I think I'm still learning. Uh, still, my mind is not absolutely clear, but today's lecture made things from 2D to 3D. That was very important. And it integrated the graphics with clinical cases. That's excellent. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Jean Mark uh, absolutely for his uh, contribution and easy explanations of all very complicated things. I also appreciate his using the cursor to draw the lines, which feel like I am using a blackboard. That's excellent. And thank you, iOS, for organizing this lecture to the benefit of participants and even for a person like me. Thank you. So nice of you, sir. Thank you so much from the your side. Sir, we have a few questions. Can we take a few questions from you, Professor Marmi? I got three minutes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. Thank you. 
Dr. Junmak Ritruwe, it's a pleasure on behalf of the Indian Orthodontic Society. I'm sorry we have to present the certificate to you virtually like this. Uh, we would also be sending it to you by email. And uh, I would also like to say that despite this being an Indian holiday, a very important Indian holiday, we've had more than 600 participants today. And uh, many of them are students, and I'm sure they vastly benefited from your excellent presentation. Not just the content, but also the way you um, expressed what you had to say. Uh, your uh, passion for this subject and your uh, depth of knowledge is very obvious the way you presented it. And for that, on behalf of all the members of the Indian Orthodontic Society, I thank you so much. And wow, it's so my pleasure. My pleasure was, on behalf of the president and all the members to present the certificate to you. Thank you. And uh, I, I, again, it's a, it's a tough subject. It's usually not very popular. People hate it because they just want to see before, after, before, after, before, after. But I, I like to stay in the middle. I know I try to explain and I can show you a lot of errors I've made tons. And uh, that's the way I, I learned through these 30 years, you know, because I think the straight wire system has, is a great system. It has oversimplified orthodontics to a certain extent for complicated cases. And I think biomechanics is really important. And I appreciate the Indian orthodontists to have been listening to me for so long. And uh, I appreciate their patience. And hopefully, again, uh, they, 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 they got something out of this lecture. Because Thank I you. think it's really important. I think Thank we you. have a few questions for you. So over to Dr. Sanjay Lab. So, sir, do you have some few minutes, two, three, four minutes? We can, can we take questions? or? Otherwise, okay, it's absolutely okay, no problem. We can just because email it to him. I think if he's running out yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah, he's he running out of time. time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I request President Sir to give the concluding remark on this lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Jean-Marc Khatrove, for a wonderful lecture on biomechanics. As you have very clearly mentioned that we are more used to seeing before and after and nothing in between. So you have filled that uh, in-between gap and showed us the importance of biomechanics in getting good finishes. I think the way you have portrayed it in a graphical 3D animation, it was so amazing that you know if we could actually relate to the, uh, the changes that were happening. It was a fantastic way of teaching. I must say you are a wonderful teacher. And a lot of us uh, who had to little brush up a little bit of biomechanics as we had studied long back, it was a it was a good tutorial. We could learn, we could brush, and we could update ourselves to biomechanics in a different way. I think this is the new age of teaching, and it is definitely giving us ideas how to teach the new age generation of orthodontists who are going to come. Thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. We really appreciate it. We look forward to having you physically somewhere in the distant future uh, to interact with you in a more personal level. And I also take this opportunity to thank the senior panelists who are here. Professor O.P. Karbanda, sir, thank you so much uh, for being here. Really thank appreciate you. that. And Dr. Jaydis, sir, and Dr. Jyoti, sir, was also there. So I thank them also. And uh, Dr. Sanjay, wonderful job. I mean, you are the way you are uh, moderating the whole show. We really appreciate your efforts. And of course, the hardworking uh, Madam Secretary, Dr. Sridevi, thank you so much uh, for the, being the force behind the show and uh, controlling the whole effort from the remote control. Thank you so much. Thank you, Divya Roop. Thank you, Uday. Thank you, uh, Dr. Puneet Patra. Thanks to all the audience, all the seniors and the members who have joined today for uh, the lecture in spite of being in the middle of a very important festival. Thank you all for being there. Uh, have a great uh, Navratri and Dasera. God bless you all. Stay safe. Stay cheerful. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank, Thank you, sir. You Thank so you very much, sir. Okay, sir. So it's, yeah, bye bye. So, sir, we may end the yes. meeting. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you. May the festivities continue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we will meet after 15 days. Uday is here, but Uday. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Uday, you can say the vote of thanks. The professor has to leave, so no problem. You can say yes, the vote yes, of thanks. Yes, yes, yes. Let's uh, finish the formalities. In the true spirit of our orthodontic uh, correction, sir, we overcome obstacles at the end by making everything straight. In these difficult times also, the speaker has come in the pandemic. 
in a webinar form and has presented his wisdom. And we are very happy in the festive season and the weekend. Happy Dasra one and all. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Jean Mark Rotrovi, for your uh, sharing of the wisdom. Thank you very much. And I thank, thank all you. the thank organizing uh, staff. I thank the President, uh, Honorable uh, Secretary, Madam, and President, Sir, and all the EC members for giving me this opportunity. Once again, thank you very much. Thanks, dear uh, Uday. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you, Uday. Yes, sir. It was really a wonderful lecture. Question. <laughs> And it's so nice of him that he had another, another webinar, but he has completely explained whatever he had to. But we could not take question. This is for the first time in this complete whole Illuminati series. But most of the things were self-answered by him. So we'll meet in our next webinar after 15 days with Professor Mitran Gunavardhane on surgery first approach. So we are bringing each webinar is a different topic. So now gear up for surgery first approach on 15 days from now. So thank you all. Happy Dasara. Bye bye. Good night. Shubhratri. Shubhratri. Yeah. Bye.